Greetings in our Savior's precious name this morning. It is good to be here in God's sanctuary to worship together this morning. Welcome our visitors. Thankful that you're here to worship with us today. I don't normally do this, but there is a special visitor over in the wing today. His name is Craig Yaney, and he is one of my friends that I learned to know through accounting with choice or um, medical aid. He is our auditor that we work with every year, and and he said sometime he wants to come and and take in a worship service with us here. So welcome, Craig, and your small tribe that you have there. I'm glad they're all here. So I was blessed by being here this morning. Um, Steve's opening his meditation from Isaiah 55 I thought was very, very fitting. The come everyone, the universal call. Come to the truth. And isn't it just amazing how Isaiah prophesied these or said these things many, many, many years before Messiah actually came. And the direct references that he made is undeniable. It's there. Just a blessing to be able to read scripture and to see that over and over again. As most of you are aware, we are preaching from us pastors are taking turns going through Romans, and today is no exception. Um, I'm not exactly sure how it worked out that I got to preach on Romans 8. I was a little excited when I saw that that's where it's going to land, but when I studied it, I started to feel like I'm a bit incompetent for something this grand, if you will. However, with God's help, I, I want to, to start on Romans 8. I, I don't have time to preach the whole chapter. But um, starting in verse 1 today, um, I'd like to review chapter 7 a bit. I think it, we do well to back up and get a bit, of a bit of a setting where we're coming from as we start in this chapter. We need to back up and, and, and at least several verses at the end there. Chapter 7 really does show a deplorable picture of failure and inability of the Mosaic law to provide salvation, justification, and sanctification. You read chapter 7 and it just, it's just up and down. There's good pieces there and there's, there's failure. There's the things I do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, I do. And, and, and where is he going with all of this? Um, we were not here last Sunday. I did listen to Dean's message. And, and so I, I, I kind of springing off of that. Um, I would suggest the person that Paul was describing is, is not the clearest. We don't exactly know who he's describing or if he's describing any person in particular. Perhaps it was his experience prior to his encounter with God on the road to Damascus. We don't know if, if that's where he felt himself, if that's where he was. I don't know. I would suggest it could be anyone that tries to live right, quote right, without a conversion experience. This is the kind of, this is the kind of condition you may find yourself in. I recently heard of a man that refuses to acknowledge his need of a savior. He's a good man. He even goes to church with his wife and children but he denies that he needs a savior. That's, that's truly sad. I imagine that a person like this, the man I mentioned, would experience the emotional ups and downs. I don't know. But I think the law had the ability to produce these kind of, of reactions. Dean mentioned in last week's sermon that thankfully we have verses 24 and 25. And I 100% agree with that. A wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And then we come in, in chapter 8. I'm going to read the verse, first 17 verses. 
And I'm reading from the King James today. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. What a, what a powerful passage we have here. Paul ended the previous chapter and he made a reference to making a choice with our mind to serve God. We choose to accept the gift of grace and serve God or we could say we choose God's way of living. We all inherit by default the law of sin and death because of the choice of Adam. So now we've made this choice to serve God. We've made the choice of accepting God's plan of salvation. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. There is no condemnation. Condemnation, a definition of condemnation would be the expression of very strong disapproval. I think we've all felt condemnation from time to time. Disapproval. Our actions produce disapproval in someone that we look up to. And we could say we felt a tinge of condemnation, perhaps. The previous chapter, I think, gives us an example of someone that may have felt this. Someone who, it seems, was trying to live a good life on their own power or determination. It produces the response of, Oh, wretched man that I am. We have no condemnation. This gift, this free gift, allows us to feel no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, or we could say do not follow the law, the Mosaic law, but after the Spirit. It's not that hard, folks. Follow the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Now you might say, well, I thought there was no law in spirit living. I think I'll clarify it a bit. The law of the spirit of life is referring to a way of living, a standard of living compared to the Mosaic law. Being spirit led and being followers of the Mosaic law are two vastly different things. And he uses the word, the law of the spirit of life as a, as a way to define living the way Jesus taught us to live. 
talking to Christians, people who have accepted Jesus into their hearts and lives, people who are living out of the teachings of Jesus in everyday living, people who die to the ways of the flesh and are led by the Holy Spirit living in their hearts, the center, the cusp of Christianity. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, okay, I, found, I covered that already, is referring to the way of life. Paul uses the word law here, and we often confuse this word with the thoughts of Jewish law, and etc. By accepting the Holy Spirit-inspired way of life, we are effectively free from the results of Adam when he brought sin into this world. We recall from chapter 5 how every child of Adam, by default, sins. And we know sin produces death. We have the great opportunity to accept the plan of Almighty God that is possible because of the obedience of one man, Jesus, which produces freedom. And that is reason for praise. That is why we glorify. That's why we have praise worship. That's why we honor God. Moving on to verses 3 and 4, for what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, <clears throat> God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit the law of Moses was and still is insufficient to save me from my sins could not could not do the law cannot pardon the law cannot sanctify the law is righteous though and therefore condemns unrighteousness which is exactly where we find ourselves because of Adam. No choice of our own. We were all born bent on unrighteousness. And the law brings that out very clearly. The wonderful plan of God included sending his only son to this earth in the flesh, mind you, in the same form as us. He was born after the manner of all babies with the huge exception of Adam's sinful default nature. Reread how Jesus was tempted but did not yield to these temptations. By following through with this plan of obedience, Jesus condemned sin. Jesus conquered sin. When we live Holy Spirit-led lives, we have the ability to live righteously which ironically was the purpose of the Law of Moses. Think about it, the Law of Moses was to produce righteousness. It took the fulfillment of Jesus, death and resurrection, which allows us to live a righteous life if we accept that gift. Verse five, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit, simply bringing out you serve the flesh, you follow your fleshly ways, that's what you're going to do, that's what you're going to think about. Paul is simply pointing out the obvious differences between non-believers and believers. Basically the difference between a Jew and Christians in his audience. Or an, I should maybe say a, um, or an Orthodox Jew yet. There was converted Jews here in Rome along with <clears throat> Gentiles that were being brought to salvation. Galatians 5 verse, or brings out, Galatians 5 verses 22 to 25, talks about the fruit of the Spirit. It is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And these fruits are the results of walking in the Spirit. They are there. They will be there. If they're not there, we have every, every reason to question, why not? Where, where is the Holy Spirit in your hearts? Is He there? Moving on to 6, six through 8. For to be carnally minded is death. <clears throat> but to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against God for it is not subject to the law of God neither indeed can be so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God <clears throat> it is impossible to please God by living in the flesh 
Galatians 6 brings out, For he that soweth to his flesh shall the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall the Spirit reap life everlasting. The carnal mind, we all know, is a result of the fall of man. And we recall the hatred that God expressed for sin. So yes, obviously the carnal mind and self-serving person is at odds with God. It's just, it's just the way it is. That person is not agreeing with God, and there is no way possible aside from confessing Jesus as Lord of their lives. Only then are we subject to God's system. Only then can we escape, escape the condemnation. When we subject or submit to God's system and invite the presence of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and lives, we will please God. Only then. Following the law, living, quote, right, will eventually peel off unless it is a true heart conversion experience. James 4 also speaks to these people. In verse 4, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. You cannot serve two masters. It's either one or the other. Moving on to verse 9. <clears throat> but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of God, he is none of his. Have you ever wondered why Paul would, would start something and then he would back up and he would, he would go back to something else again and then he would finish his train of thought? It's interesting. Paul is writing to Christians in the church of Rome. This church was made up of born again Jews and Gentiles that also accept salvation. We notice Paul doubling back just a bit here and floats the idea that there are perhaps those in the church that are fake. The term, none of his, at the end of the verse there, none of his, speaking of none of God's, none of his, that's a terrible thought. I never knew you, depart from me, you are none of his. There are two options in life. Either we serve God and are called His own, or we choose the other way and know that we are none of His. The second option is obviously... I'm sorry. There are two options in life. Number one, either we serve God and are called His own, or we choose the other way and know that we are none of His. The second option is obviously one that serves self and ultimately results in death and eternal destruction in hell. What an awful place to be found. None of his. And, and, and what brought you to none of his, or what brings a man to none of his, is rejecting the Spirit of God or rejecting salvation. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. He's telling these Christians, you're in the Spirit. You have the Spirit. If so be, the Spirit dwells in you. Okay, let's make sure that it's there. Moving on to verse 10. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. This verse in the NIV reads, But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin. Yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. Let's take a bit of time here and analyze what is he saying in this verse? Am I dead to sin? Am I, what's, what's the dead part he's referring to here? Humanity before the de death and resurrection of Jesus is doomed because of the fall of Adam. We understand that. After the death and resurrection, our spirit, <coughs> our spirit, think body, soul, spirit, our spirit is alive because of the righteousness or the rightness of God's plan of redemption. I studied Barnes quite a bit on, on this, this little nugget here and some of these quotations that I'll read to you, that's where I got them, but the body being 
dead, that phrase, is a controversial one. And he laid out several, several ones that we hear. And surprisingly enough, I recognize some of them. Okay, I've heard that. I quote, This passage has been interpreted in very different ways. Some understand it to mean that the body is dead in respect to sin. The body is dead in respect to sin. That is, that sin has no more power to excite evil passions and desires. Others, that the body must die on account of sin, but that the spiritual part shall live, and even the body shall live also in the resurrection. He goes on to say that the body is dead because of, or Barnes goes on to say that he thinks the body is dead because of sin, and it means just that. I quote again, the body, or pre-conversion or pre-new dispensation, is subject to corrupt passions and desires, and may be said thus to be dead, as it has none of the elements of the spiritual life. The spirit of man has been recovered and made alive through his plan of justification. It communicates life and recovers man from his death in sin to life. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin. Okay, we are all same as dead because of Adam's choice of sinning, or he brought sin into this world. But if Christ is in you, your spirit is alive because of the righteousness of God. And our bodies can be alive and produce a godly life because of that. All this because of the righteousness of our God. It's hard for us to grasp the, the, the way Paul is, is going through this, but it's a beautiful, beautiful picture. Verse 11, But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. A person that accepts Jesus into their hearts and asks Him to be the Lord of his life receives the Holy Spirit in his heart. We, we are good with that. We, we, we believe that. We have the presence of God, so to speak, with us at all times. Paul is saying here that we have the same power that raised Jesus from the dead available right in our hearts. This same power is with us every day. And I quote Barnes again, Christians thus, in their bodies and their spirits, become sacred. For even their body, the seat of evil passions and desires, shall become alive in the service of God. I like that. We come alive in the service of God. 2 Corinthians 4 says, verse 14, Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. The power of Christ allows us to be presented to God with Jesus. Paul goes on in verse 12, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors. All this produces a feeling of well, Paul called himself a slave to the gospel. We are indebted. Wow, what did we do to deserve this? If the grace of God doesn't come through in this passage, I don't know where you'll find it. The results of the Holy Spirit empowering us to live holy lives of service should cause us to fall before Almighty God in gratefulness and worship. At this point, we choose to either 
live after the flesh and experience death or mortify or put to death our old Adamic nature and live forever. Once again, in verse 12, Paul doubles back. He has to go back, not to the flesh. No, we're not debtors to the flesh to live after that. We, we, we let that lay. For if you live after the flesh, you're going to die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify or kill the deeds of the body, by the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, ye shall live. It produces more. He moves on in 14 through 17. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the, what? The sons of God. Think about that a while. 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. We know what fear is. We've come from there. We, we left that lay. But ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit. The Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. That's exciting, folks. That's exciting. As many as are led, verse 14, as many as are led, submission to the Spirit leading us. Sounds great, but who of us finds it easy to submit? Submission to someone or something is, is a bit tough sometimes. But notice what it what what happens when we submit. But as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And then we move on to the spirit of adoption. Notice he goes back to the spirit of bondage again. We're not there. He's saying we left that there. But you have this, received the spirit of adoption. What? The spirit of adoption. You know what happens when someone adopts someone? A child? The feeling of affection, love, and confidence which pertains to children. Not the trembling part or spirit of slaves but the temper and affectionate regard of sons. This is what happens. We are adopted into the family of God. We now have the right to say, Abba, Father. It is true. It is very true. Adoption also implies that we have no rights to this. We did not earn it. We were chosen to accept this sonship, quote, S-O-N, sonship, if we wanted it. It is an act of kindness by God. By accepting this offer, we find ourselves under the protection offered by our Father. We also find ourselves responsible to honor and glorify our Father. And we do this by living lives according to the teaching of Jesus. Our response should be one of Abba, Father. Abba, Father, is two words with very similar meanings. It says it twice. It brings out a very personal relationship. I like to think of it as, thank you, Heavenly Daddy. We think of daddies as, as being dear to children. And, and our children come to us, and they call us Daddy, and we love it. Our Heavenly Father wants nothing more than to have us come. Thank you, Heavenly Daddy, for what you've done for us. And the Holy Spirit moves on and provides evidence to my spirit, my body, soul, spirit, my spirit, that we are the sons and daughters of God. There's this dialogue, there's this confirmation that we can absolutely claim as ours, personal. As adopted children of the Heavenly Father, we also become heirs of who? Scripture says heirs of God, God Himself. Joint heirs with none other than Jesus. Our inheritance includes living here 
in the favor of God and also the promise of life eternal. That will be the crowning finish to life as we know it. We don't know our future. We live in a, a time of prosperity. We live in a time of relatively safe, safety in, in our country. But we look at history, and Christians have suffered terribly over the years, and in some parts of the world still are suffering. We have this promise that someday we will be glorified together with Jesus Christ, our Savior. I am looking forward to that day. And after studying passages like this, the pull to go gets strong. We were made for better than this, folks. Let's never forget. We were made to honor and glorify God here. But one day we will sing and praise and have a worship service like we've never experienced. And I'm looking forward to that. Let's stand for prayer. <clears throat> Thank you, Father, for this passage of your word. Thank you that we can study it and learn from it. Thank you that you are our Abba Father and that we can have this relationship through the adoption that you have sent our way. You have called us to be your children, your sons and your daughters. Thank you so much for this, Father. I just thank you that we could worship you like this today. And God, I pray that we would continue to serve you with everything that we've got. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.